How's it going everyone? Welcome back to Fraud on the Telly. In today's video, we're breaking down everything that happened in Critical Role Campaign 3 episode 43. The episode we've been waiting for. As finally on the last episode of Critical Role for 2022, we get some massive ruinous lore bombshells. As always, if you enjoyed the video and learned something new, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Don't forget to ring that tiny bell so my videos go directly into your feed. Let's just get right into the video, shall we? This information is crazy, so it's time to break it all down. So when we last left at the party, they were adventuring to EOS. They had just arrived in EOS finally to seek some answers over all the crazy stuff that has been going on with Ruidus. They make their way to one of the seminaries, one of the many schools within EOS, searching for one Professor Ebenold Kai. And speaking with one of the clerks there at the university, they learned that Ebenold Kai has been missing for some time now. They believe that he is either um, rewriting curriculum or off researching in some aspect it's then that the party is interrupted by some strange hulking figure a strange hulking man wearing an odd bronze mask with no eye holes of any kind we learn through a an amazing nat 20 history role that these are known as judicators of the gods warriors who've shown so much devotion to the god that they receive some type of strange blessing apparently vasselheim uses these strange creatures strange humans as almost bloodhounds, bodyguards, um, just overall problem-solving uh, beings. It seems that they're in Eos hunting uh, a certain set of stolen papers from Vasselheim. If you remember, a set of stolen papers that were referenced early on in Campaign 3. A set of papers that refer to two strange missing gods way back in the founding. The party then make their way to Ebenold Kai's house, eventually breaking in. They discover that it does not seem to be inhabited uh, for some wild though chetney catches faint smells of sweat and believes that there is someone hiding within imogen cast detect thoughts discovering that there are two other minds somewhere beneath them they eventually find a secret entrance leading down into the cellar where ebon lukai and another woman are are hiding obviously they don't know the bell's hell's intention so the lady casts a spell enacting a teleportation circle bamfing them away with bell's hell's managing to i guess go through the circle in time i was very curious about this scene if matt was going to allow this um or maybe not everyone was going to get in but it's too important to the story i guess so they had to uh let everyone get in the teleportation circle in time as they all bamfed to a strange cavern with lava one that fans of campaign 2 probably recognize as this is the home this is one of the outposts used by planewalker wren now we know little about planewalker wren they did make an appearance in campaign 2 we know that they are some kind of a, a powerful magical caster a tiefling who walks the planes actually i was wrong her name is plain rider Rin, so i guess she rides the planes she is a magical caster who studies the natures of the planes in exandria finally the situation seems to calm down enough the uh, bell's house explaining to um professor kai that they are in fact friends they do have mutual acquaintances and this is when we get some of the massive massive lore drop we learned that the woman with uh, Ebenold Kai is Dr. Baron Vestisho, and that they are one of the people who took these uh, texts from Vasiline, the texts indicating ancient gods. Apparently, there was much more to these texts that we didn't know at the time. We went through Dr. Baron the names of these two deities that had gone missing. One, Ethodoc, the Endless Shadow, and two, Vordo, the Fate Shaper. Apparently, they had been eaten or destroyed in some kind of capacity by some creature, some entity known as Predathos, Predathos, something along those lines. Apparently, this is an entity that the gods knew in some kind of way and had been running from. They are scared of this creature, this entity, and in some kind of way, uh, it hunted them down to Exandria and then ate or destroy two of their god brethren remember this is in the time of the founding before the calamity before the schism i'm pretty sure so the gods um working with the primordials managed to take a chunk of exandria presumably a continent um and transform it into ruidus a prison for this being known as predathos it seems in a lot of ways when we think back to a lot of the information we learned from EXU Calamity from Asmodeus uh, and his talks with Xerxes, it doesn't seem like Asmodeus was lying as much as we thought he was. Indeed, there was a pact 
with the primordials it seems that the pact that the gods had with the primordials ran deeper than we thought if with the primordials they managed to um contain some sort of being that obviously the gods felt were a necessary threat to them it's interesting then when we look at it in the context of the calamity as who really were the betrayer gods in the context if the gods made a deal made a, a pact in a kind of a way with the primordials creatures who existed on exandria long before the gods got there then who really were the ones who were betraying apparently we learned that Vaselheim has been keeping this information secret basically trying to cover it up in order to prevent the information of predathos and the true nature of ruidus from coming out as this is a massive danger Imogen explains who she is to Ebenold Kai, exactly who her mother is. Uh, we learned that Imogen, along with several other, I guess, Ruidus-born people like Otahan and possibly her mother, are known as Exalted. They exhibit certain abilities, uh, obviously uh, Imogen's very strong psychonic abilities, her ability to blow up a block of a town as well as to fly and many of her other strange powers which we know come from ruidus and apparently come from this strange creature predathos For whatever reason there seem to be some ruidus born people that have a greater connection with ruidus and predathos than others thus they're able to draw on this creature's power more than others you're going to learn a bit more about Otahan, though there's still a lot of information that we don't know about her. As many of the information we've learned about her suggests she was once a pious worshipper of the Raven Queen, possibly during the Apex War as well. And then after the Apex War, she seemed to have lost her faith in some kind of way, seemingly found a new one in Ruidus and Predathos in her abilities. She's believed to also be exalted, a scion of uh, Predathos of Ruidus. Now then we have the question of just what the heck is going on with Predathos, this strange being in Ruidus and the events going on on the Prime Material Plane, the Feywild, and what we learn is in Exandria. What are the Cerberus Assembly, Otahan, and the Unsteely Court up to? We learn that the strange telescope like uh, machines that are being built are all being built in the same point across all three of the planes. There's one in the Hellcatch Valley that exists um, on the exact same point parallel. In a point in the Feywild as well as in the Shadowfell. It's almost as if these three telescope, for lack of a better word, type um, structures are being used as some kind of an anchor point, possibly to bring the moon down, to crack it open, to, I don't know, we've theorized in many other videos to, um, I guess, break potentially the barriers between the planes, making just one plane, combining the Shadowfell with the Feywild, with the Prime Material, we still just don't know. There's a lot, a lot of questions that are left unanswered, even with all of this huge lore information that we got. And so we learned that the number of Ruidus-born people have been increasing over the last few years, maybe 10, 20, 30-ish years, and that they are all gathering in the Hellcatch Valley. This is most likely the uh, army of people that Imogen used to see in her dreams with Otahan. Um, stepping forward, this is an army of potentially Ruidus-born people, and we know that her mom, Imogen's mom, for whatever reason, is working with Otahan, I guess, to get some kind of answers about her true nature, which is funny because we talked about this last week in our uh, break breakdown reaction video to um, the last week's episode of Critical Role, that it seems like Imogen's mom's motives are very up in the air, and we don't know if exactly if she's a good person or not. From here, the group, I guess, tried to conduct a plan, try to devise a, um, a path going forward. The most likely idea is to attack one of these two entities, either in the Feywild or in the Shadowfell, as they will be the least protected, the one in the Shadowfell specifically the least protected. They think about using Fern's grandmother, Mori, uh, who we know is the Fate Stitcher, a, um, a powerful hag who is one of the guardians of one of the Thanes in the Feywild. So she has the ability to transport them in and out of the Feywild without them... Um, getting any weird wonky time magic going on as time is of the essence currently in our campaign. But if I had to guess, Mori being a very powerful hack will most likely ask for something in return from the party. Our episode ends as the troop are transported back to Eos to collect Ashton, who Talison missed this episode, so his character was off doing some strange side mission. Um, they are transported back uh, into Ebenold Kai's house, into his basement, 
where they hear the rummaging of uh, someone above, most likely one of the Judicators, and our episode ends. So huge information here that's going to affect much of the campaign going forward. We've put out so many theories. We've talked about all the big theories that have been going on. A lot of them in many uh, regards, we were right. There was some strange entity in the moon. It is not these two missing gods, though. The question does arise, though, what happened to these two missing gods? Are they dead? We know that for gods, it's really, really hard to actually destroy them permanently. The Raven Queen is, and her ascension is basically one of the only um, examples that we've seen of a god truly being permanently destroyed. So then is it going to be some situation like Red Riding Hood where if we cut Predathus open, these two gods are going to come crawling out of its belly? Are they gone forever? Did uh, Predathus join and combine with these two gods when it ate them in some kind of way? We really just don't know many, many questions. Also, the question arises, um, is this the grand arc of campaign three, the grand narrative, the big overarching story, or is this just going to be um, a fixable arc for Bell's Hells, where there'll be future different arcs for Bell's Hells in the future? Originally, we thought that this was going to set up some kind of calamity-esque situation, but now I'm not so sure. We wondered how Bell's Hells would put a stop to this big uh, upcoming event with the Apogee Solstice in a few weeks in game time when they just don't seem to be powerful enough or have the allies uh, to be able to pull off such a feat. Now, it does still seem like an uphill battle if they're going to be able to stop uh, the events of this upcoming Apogee Solstice. It's like we said, this is coming very, very quickly. We're going to be need to be working real hard. Also, shocker, I can't believe they waited until the very last episode of 2022. We said that they were going to do this, guys, to reveal the big cliffhanger that they've basically been teasing for the last year now, Matt really knows uh, his way around a cliffhanger, and man, is it infuriating sometimes. This video is already getting long, so let me know your thoughts, theories, and predictions in the comments down below. Expect more theory videos with this new information about Campaign 3 on the way, um, as we're going to have a Christmas break and a hiatus uh, up until January 6th or 5th, I believe, until our next episode of Critical Role. Things are really starting to heat up. I love this whole big... Uh, narrative story. I love the deep lore. I love um, all of the lore and the tut callbacks to EXU Calamity, going all the way back to the founding. Critical Role, one of my favorite things about Critical Role is the world building, the amazing, crazy lore that Matt has come up with, and the fact that he's been setting these seeds for this campaign for absolutely years now, um, and just dropping little hints everywhere, and it's all finally starting to come together. And I just can't wait to see exactly what is going on. As always, if you enjoyed the video, learn something new, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. I'd love to see your comments and your theories in the comments down below. Expect a big Campaign 3 updated theory video later on in the week, guys. And as always, I hope to see you in the next one. Stay safe out there. Happy holidays. Until next time. Peace. Love. Adieu.